and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Rowan Gray, a JSD candidate at Cornell Law School and president of the Modern Money Network. We will discuss his work on the intersection of modern monetary theory and intellectual property theory. So welcome to the show, Rowan. Thanks for having me. Uh, the pleasure is truly all mine in this case. I really enjoyed this paper um, and found it offered a perspective that hadn't occurred to me at all before. But once it's one of those great ones where once you say it, the implications seem really deep and, and obvious. So c- congrats on this. I think it's really a, a fascinating project. Thanks a lot. Yeah. So I was wondering, Rowan, if you could start uh, for lis- for listeners like myself who might not be very familiar with modern monetary theory, I wonder if you could start by just saying a little bit about what modern monetary theory is and how it's related to the job guarantee. And in particular, I really like the kind of head and heart metaphor that you used. And that was sort of like, it helped me kind of wrap my head around what was going on as it were. Yeah, sure. So I think the first thing is that the the term modern in the word modern monetary theory is not supposed to mean sort of the last 20 or 50 or 100 years or sort of modernity in that sense, but is a, is a reference to a Keynes quote where he says, um, the state comes in as a sort of entity that establishes um, not only uh, the enforcement of contracts and other things like that, but also determines the uh, unit in which you have to pay contracts. And that's been true of all modern societies for the last 4,000 years. So the word modern monetary theory is really looking at large societies where social relations have gone beyond um, face-to-face kin relationships into large kind of social structures that have you know, legal and political institutions governing them. Um, and and the, the, I use the head and the heart metaphor because I sort of see it as um, – explaining things around two axes. One is about the nature of money itself. So you often would hear in an economics textbook that um, money kind of emerges out of barter as a slightly more convenient technology to sort of facilitate what they would call um, getting around the double coincidence of wants, where if you want something from a third party who wants to give something from me to me, um, we can't all transact if we're bartering, but money kind of serves as this Um, placeholder so that we can all sort of barter um, between ourselves in larger units. Um, And what MMT says is that's actually not historically and anthropologically accurate at all. Um, Historically, and this has been backed up by legal um, historians, by anthropologists, by sociologists, um, most monetary systems, if not all of the major ones in history, have emerged when a political authority, whether it's a a tribe or a religious authority or a a king or a warlord or a modern democratic state um, imposes a sort of tax or a fee or a fine or some sort of legal kind of um, obligation on its subjects and then declares what kind of instrument or unit or token those subjects have to earn in order to pay the tax. And so it flips the story around. Instead of being a sort of neutral peer-to-peer horizontal relationship, it's always from the outset uh, a, a, an outcome of a political community where there's coercion and hierarchy. And also kind of counterintuitively, um, the reason the political authority issues money is not so that it can tax it back because it doesn't need to tax back what it already creates. The token could be completely valueless. It could be a piece of paper. It could be a stick. It could be a shell. The reason it taxes is so that the rest of us need to earn the currency. And so it can pay us to do real things, whether it's military service or you know becoming a firefighter or whatever else. And then over time, once that what they call the fiscal circuit starts to get established, people start to want to accumulate that unit of the, that currency um, so that they could trade between each other. I might not want to do military service, but if you do two months of military service, you can pay me and I can do work for you. And then the kind of private economy emerges out of that core public economy. Um, so I call that the kind of head of modern monetary theory because it, it's about the denaturalizing of money. And once we do that and start to look at how the economy works or how modern monetary systems work, it, it opens up a whole new record range of questions that um, aren't obvious when you start with kind of a market-oriented theory. 
Um, the, the heart is, is the job guarantee. And the reason for that is because what it also shows is that all work in a monetary economy is a function of the monetary system itself. Um, there's a post-Keynesian economist named Paul Davidson who likes to sort of make the observation that whatever else is going on in um, slave economies or even sort of schools of fish, um, very rarely do those kinds of economies have unemployment. Unemployment is a uniquely monetary phenomenon where somebody wants to earn money but can't find a way of doing so. And what MMT says is unemployment is always and everywhere a feature of the design of the monetary system. That is to say, it's not something unique to the person who's somehow, you know, lazy or unproductive. It's not even a fault of sort of investment decisions of the market. It's about the choice of the entity that creates money, not to create the conditions under which everyone can earn money. Um, and what MMT says is if you accept that as something that it can be changed by the political authority, then we have the ability to do things like offer a job guarantee where we say we're going to give, say, 15 or $20 an hour to anybody who wants to work. And in doing so, we will anchor the value of that currency in real terms to whatever people choose to work on the, the, the output that, that comes from that work. And so there's a kind of denaturalizing of both the labor market and the monetary system and connecting them in that way. So, I mean, if, if, if you could kind of like put it in a nutshell, what's sort of like the fundamental hypothesis of modern monetary theory about how the, how the monetary system actually works in practice as opposed to sort of um, how it's described by classical economics and why this job guarantee approach is possible as it were. Yeah, sure. So I would probably say money is a public monopoly. It is a creature of public governance and law. And therefore, no aspect of the monetary system is um, natural or beyond the ability to be changed through public policy and law. And that includes the existence or the elimination thereof of involuntary unemployment. And that it's just as possible to create a stable economy where the value of money is stable with full employment where everybody who wants to work as it is in a society where that isn't the case. Yeah, it's like it's like a question of what policies we adopt. I mean, you used there was a phrase I thought was really interesting that you said, um, you know, even if the labor theory of value isn't literally true, we can make it practically true. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, this is a pretty, I used to teach um, early childhood, you know, kids who are five years old. And if you tell kids at the age of five that they can work for $20 an hour and when they grow up, no, no questions asked, everybody, you know, I use the metaphor of a kind of hand crank in the wall. I mean, maybe that's even too ableist to require a hand, but you know, if you turn the hand crank for three minutes, a dollar pops out. That conception is very easy. Even a five-year-old can understand that. And if you start to go outside and you think, okay, well, I want to buy a, a can of soda and it costs me a dollar, it's very easy for people to think, well, at the very minimum, that's going to cost me three minutes of my time. And you, know, you might be able to get more skills and a higher paying job and that's fine. But at the very minimum, anyone who's able to work should be able to go up to that sort of metaphorical hand crank and pop out a dollar as long as they're willing to give three minutes of their time. And that creates a direct material link between people's time, which we all only have one life on this planet. We've only got one heartbeat um, and, and the amount of money that we can actually generate through the monetary system for ourselves. Yeah. I mean, it's really, what was especially interesting for me is that on, on this kind of superficial level, it resembles something like a minimum wage, but it's actually doing something really different. It's like setting a floor on the price for labor, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that MMT has often say is the effective minimum wage stays zero. Because if you want a job and you can't get it, it doesn't matter what the minimum wage is for people with a job, you're the other guy. Um, and so you need to be very clear that if you want a true effective minimum wage, you need to actually offer the opportunity to work to everybody who wants it. And one of the things we've seen in the last decade is people who say they weren't even looking for work as the labor market gets better and better, start to pick up jobs. So even the numbers of the kind of quote unquote, you know, unemployed today are 
grossly underestimating the number of people that would probably like to do work. And that goes all the way through to people with disabilities. There's a great book called um, No Right to Be Idle. Um, I forget the author. Um, I think Sarah something, Hope maybe. Um, but she talks about how in the early 19th century, um, disability was sort of created as a legal category. And before that, the expectation was everybody would kind of pitch in. But that in, in part in order to sort of protect the labour market um, and, and earning capacity of people who are more able, there was this sort of category of the disabled that was created to sort of put people in and, and, and ice them out of the ability to work alongside everybody else in working conditions. So I think the, the, the idea that everybody has a right, an inalienable human right, to participate in economic life is something that a job guarantee is a sort of trying to achieve at a policy level or to sort of start to enact um, because until we actually offer that, we'll never know how many people would like to participate. Mm -hmm. Well, so shifting gears a little bit, you point out that, at least on your description and my understanding, that modern monetary theory has not really grappled so much with the role of real property at this point. And you point to what you see as some tensions between property ownership and the kind of social goals of modern monetary theory. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about why those two are in tension and how you think that tension manifests itself. Yeah, sure. So I, I use the kind of um, schema of Polanyi's fictitious commodities in part because he was one of the first kind of political economists that I studied when I was younger. So I've always held a special place for him and in part um, just because I thought it was a useful kind of framework. But he says that, you know, the, the, whatever else you could say about the market, the market for land, labor and money um, do not work the way that commodities work in kind of traditional economic theory. And so every time we try to apply commodity market logic to those markets, it ends up causing serious problems. And the point that I make, I think, you know, even more than saying there's a tension is that MMT has done an excellent job of showing and denaturalizing the market for money and the market for labor, so to speak. But that in that story, there is less of a kind of emphasis on land in that broader Polanyian sense of referring to sort of not only the, the soil, but also things like intellectual property and the commons. Um, and one of the arguments that, or one of the stories that MMT tells about the origins of money is that it can come from imposing taxes. Um, and so it's often framed as sort of something like a head tax or a hut tax, where it's actively imposed on people. Um, but one of the points that I make is uh, you can tell the same story through enclosure, uh, and, and the, obviously the British enclosure movement is the classic example, but I use the sort of story when I'm teaching, you know, if you're in the middle of a desert and there's one oasis and you put a wall up around that oasis and you charge people who are, you know, wandering through the desert um, money to access it, then that's functionally the same as a tax. Uh, even if you're not kind of going out with a tax collector on a monthly basis, all you need to do is put, put a fence around something that people need to access for their daily life and that's going to work. So you can tell the same story that MMT tells about taxes driving money, but substitute private property and enclosure for taxes. And that if we do that, we start to see some really interesting stories or some really interesting tensions in that there is more to economic participation than just access to work because we could imagine a world on one hand where everybody has a job, but all of the output of that particularly, say, intellectual property output, but, you know, in 2019, we could also think about things like personal data, was privatized and enclosed. So every day I go to work for the government, but all of my output, all of my creative work, all of my, you know, where I was every day, the, 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 the keys that I typed on my computer are all being logged and put into a database, and that database is being used for purposes completely alien to me and, and social interest. So that's sort of one dystopian world. We've got our full employment, we've denaturalized money, but we still have this sort of dystopian privatization of incredibly important layer of society. The other side we could imagine is a world where every person who's working, the, the output and the, the commons on, on which they're working are also socially owned. And so I'm not sure I would say necessarily attention as much as an incompleteness to the story, where if we bring in this layer, it, it points to an additional set of policy considerations we need to think about as we redesign money and redesign work to be more um, in keeping with universal participation and, and public purpose. Yeah. I, am I wrong to think that on one level, it's kind of like saying that MMT needs to have like a theory of rents as well as a theory of money? 
Yeah, I, so often I think MMTers wouldn't use the word rent-seeking because it's very difficult conceptually to distinguish quote-unquote rents from non-rents um, in the broader economy uh, once you start to kind of get into the, the way that kind of profits are formed at the accounting level. But yes, I think that's a fair enough kind of abstraction for, for our purposes. There are areas where we need to think about commons, um, theories of commons ownership and theories of not only sort of distributing property, but whether actually we want to not have a proprietarian model for the governance of those resources in the first place. And I think that MMT certainly has inc incredibly useful insights for those conversations, but that until now, its focus has been on sort of the land and, uh, sorry, the labor and the money um, legs of the stool more than the, um, the land leg of the stool, so to speak. Yeah, well, I thought this was a really interesting sort of turn that you made there in the sense that, you know, you describe land ownership kind of in the enclosure sense as like a like a rent or a tax uh, that would be generated by a privatized bit of property. And the sort of the flip side is at least in theory, sort of intellectual property or intangible property, because it has this kind of non-rival quality to it, we think of at least theoretically returns to intellectual property as not being rents, but rather sort of internalization of some percentage of the positive externalities associated with with the intellectual property or the, the with intangible property that, that's being created. And as you point out, that provides a kind of commonality for conversation among people who might otherwise not share similar kind of normative or, or even not so much normative, but similar kind of empirical um, understandings of how the market for intellectual property is actually working. I, I, am I understanding sort of the, the the turn that you're making there correctly? Yeah, I think that's right. I think one of the one of the points that I make is you know there are different theories of the justification for intellectual property ranging from the kind of purely pragmatic you know um, temporary monopoly to promote arts and sciences. It's all a kind of um, uh, you know. Uh, messy middle ground between competing interests and kind of maybe pose in the land as view on one hand through to the kind of essentialist, we need to, you know, create private property rights because that's going to create the most efficient market, which is the kind of maybe, you know, sort of libertarian Frank Easterbrook perspe perspective um, all the way through to a kind of, kind of everybody does better when we can share um, peer based commons production model of people like Yokai Bankler. But underlying all of these is that they're answering the same question with different answers, which is sort of how do we incentivize um, a creative person who otherwise wouldn't want make creative works to do so? And my argument is this sort of centers a very individualistic narrative in the theory of intellectual property, whereas I think what MMT says is twofold. One, the actual starting point of analysis is we live in a society where everybody needs to work with you know some exceptions of people who can't work etc but where where work is actually a matter of survival not a matter of choice it's not like i get up every day and decide whether or not i feel it properly incentivized to go to work i go to work because i need to not starve and you know need to kind of survive in you know in a monetary economy and the second thing is the question of how we invest in in creative production um, the intellectual property story sort of says, well, the money has to come from somewhere. Therefore, you know, rather than trying to take it from people at the outset and redistribute in this centralized way, the best way to do it is to let people make stuff and let the kind of market decide. But my argument is, and this isn't even really MMT as much as it is almost sort of basic Keynes, that the actual starting point for investment is there is going to be a renewed source of additional public investment on an ongoing basis. Every year there is more investment than there was last year in a growing economy. So we're not just talking about how we kind of distribute the money in people's pockets. We actually need a theory of how every year the social surplus or the sort of investment surplus is actually being distributed. And that means that the, the starting point is really we've got a bunch of people who want to work and we've got a bunch of money that needs to be spent. And then the question is, what are we going to spend them on and what should people work on? And that gets us to, I think, a very different kind of conversation than when you're starting with this sort of 
lone Beethovenian artist who may or may not feel like being creative on a, on a particular rainy Wednesday or something. Yeah, and what, what, I mean, one of the things I really liked about the sort of turn that you made there was that I think you're right, that there is this kind of fundamentally individual-focused premise of all of the conventional economic utilitarian theories of, of intellectual property, which seems deeply ironic given that what we're talking about is sort of policy for facilitating the production of public goods. And right. it's industrial policy. Yeah, it seems backward to make it so individualistic when really what we're thinking about is how to generate goods that are going to benefit the entire society. And I think this is actually, to, at a broader level, this is a function of the failure of law in particular, but also orthodox neoclassical economic theory to really properly take into account macroeconomic dynamics. I mean, I could say neoclassical theory has sort of basically just bastardized in order to kill Keynes. But the basic point here is, you know, people like Richard Posen said, I didn't even care about macroeconomics um, until the global financial crisis because it had nothing to do with my work in law and economics. And I think that comes across in the way that we talk and think about, um, you know, the economic logic underlying intellectual property theory, um, even things like cultural economics, which I think is where you're supposed to find these conversations where there's talk about, you know, how much taxation should be used to fund public, you know, investment in the in arts and culture and things has a fundamentally scarce money framework at its core. All the money that you're investing has to come from the quote unquote, the taxpayer. And one of the things that MMT quite successfully debunks is the idea that all money comes from the taxpayer because the taxpayer had to get money from somewhere first. The taxpayer didn't just sort of magically produce money by clicking their fingers. What happened is the public monetary issuer, the monetary sovereign issued money into the economy and then the taxpayer sort of paid it back out again. But without that story at the start of where money comes from and who gets to spend that first dollar every, you know, every round, um, we're going to miss an incredibly important part of the kind of macroeconomic dynamic. And I think it's been a, you know, without sounding too conspiracy theory-ish, it's been a successful campaign by people who, who want to deny, you know, to use Margaret Thatcher's term, that there's such thing as society um, to make it seem like the only money is taxpayers' money. Yeah, and it struck me as well that, I mean, even to the extent that one might find aspects of a kind of incentives-based theory of intellectual property uh, convincing, I, I mean, it's still dependent upon this idea of, you know, uh, influencing decision-making on the margins and the risk of, of free riding, right? But that's all about the capacity of the creator to capture some of the positive externalities on the back end. I mean, it seems like on the position you're taking, you just say, well, if we give them the incentives on the front end, then we don't have to worry about any of those issues. Yeah, exactly. And, and I mean, you know, one of the things that the job guarantee isn't supposed to replace everyone's job all the time, but it's a starting point to talk about a world where everybody has access to work that's paid. I mean, how, how many sort of tropes of the starving artist have you got through history? How many stories do you have of science labs getting underfunded at universities, things like that? If you if everybody who wanted to be creative knew on day one, they could get a decent paying, you know, salary and, and a stable life. Um, and all they had to do was agree to share the output of, of what they make with everybody. Um, I think a lot of people would probably take that up. And the ones who didn't, well, okay, maybe they wouldn't. But it do I don't think that that's a question of no output versus, you know, some output. It's a question of two different modes. And they could even, theory, you know, in theory, work in parallel for a while. And we could do a real-life experiment and see which one of them actually produces better goods, I think. Things like the, the free software movement have shown that when it comes to at least certain kinds of technical goods, uh, a, a sort of non-proprietarian based model does work um, quite successfully. And, and we haven't actually tried something equivalent in, in art and culture. I think the last time we had a mass mobilization of public investment in art and culture was the New Deal. Um, and hopefully now as, as the kind of Green New Deal comes back on the, on the agenda, that, that that'll be part of it. I've been very sort of heartened by um, political leaders like um, you know, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez really emphasizing the role of art um, in, in the New Deal. And I think that you know, when, when we think about things like free college and, and reinvesting in higher education, we can think of a, a kind of intellectual job guarantee as well as things like um, you know, um, climate, um, direct climate mitigation work.
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, you know, it struck me for a long time that like our current intellectual property system is, you know, if I wanted to be a little bit negative about it, sort of like a gambling system in a yeah. sense. We're, we're, we're saying to innovators, to creators, you know, invest your time and energy on the front end. And some people will, like a tiny fraction of people will become fabulously wealthy uh, because they will produce something that turns out to be in great consumer demand or have, you know, great uh, kind of economic value in the marketplace. But the overwhelming majority of you, for better or for worse, will get basically nothing, right? It's almost like a lottery system. Of, yeah, you, know, you have to upfront the capital and the investment. I mean, not not to get too Marxian about it, but my old law professor Eben Moglin, who's a you know intellectual property his, legal historian, um, he he talks about the fact that in reality this is all about who owned the means of production. If you go back to the, the era of the printing press, the issue was that printing presses themselves were expensive to make, and once once somebody invested the time and resources into making one or buying one. They were damn sure going to use it. That wasn't the question. The question was, were they going to do things like produce business materials or smart or, you know, politically subversive literature, or were they going to produce things that had a, had a wider use for society, so to speak? Um, and, and so the, the development from the statute of Anne onwards was, uh, a kind of truce or a, a, a um, a, an olive branch to the owners of the printing presses saying, we're going to give the, the book writers an intellectual property claim in their works so that they can immediately sell them to you. And that way you'll have an incentive to print books that are going to sell well, rather than sort of printing a bunch of wedding invitations and not actually caring whether anyone turns up to the wedding because you got paid for printing them and that's the end of your involvement. Whereas the minute you can buy the, the intellectual property from the person coming in with the next, you know, bestseller, you actually care about the, the growth of that market. So the real person who's taking the gamble, I would say even more than the artist, is, is the sort of, you know, nowadays it's the, the, the movie companies and the, the music companies and things. But that, that was out of a, that's a byproduct of an earlier mode of cultural production where the infrastructure was extremely expensive. Now when it's just as easy to, um, you know, record a podcast on your laptop um, of pretty high quality, they don't actually own, you know, scarce, expensive production machinery. What they own is distribution networks that that are leftovers from a prior era when they the only ones who they were the only ones who had, you know, expensive, scarce production machinery. So I, I think you know one of the points here is if we offer a direct closed loop with people, and and now that there are these other distribution networks through things like social media, we can we can start to euthanize the the printing press owner from from this story in a way that wouldn't have been possible for for previous centuries. Mm-hmm. And and you mentioned it earlier, but I wanted to bring it up again because I really like the example of the kind of New Deal model for for the arts because it does seem like a sort of version of what you're describing, and really a version that was. I mean, of all the New Deal programs, I think one of the most successful and not a particularly expensive one either, and yet one that's really had kind of long-term impacts on on American society, which seems like a compelling argument in favor of the sort of way of looking at the problem that you're thinking of. What other potential models do you envision, envision as ways we might approach these kinds of goals? Yeah, thanks. I mean, and I, and I think definitely. I mean, there's these great books. There's one called When um, When Art Worked, um, which is just this beautiful kind of glossy all these images of the different artworks and things that came out of the New Deal. People like Jackson Pollock and Mark Rothko and a bunch of other interesting names got their start in New Deal arts programs. Um, but there were also other ones, things like people recording cultural histories of of um, elders who had been you know alive during the Civil War and things like this that were coming out of the New Deal. So it wasn't just your sort of standard fair you know public art public Public theater, public music lessons, although those did exist, it was also that kind of broader cultural, anthropological, historical kind of production, which is so valuable um, and provides an interesting kind of social alternative to the data mining um, model that we see today of how information is is gathered and retained by by technology. Um, but I, I also posit as a kind of um, complement, perhaps. I still think that kind of the direct access to, to paid social work is the first step. But the, the other thing that I posit is something that would work where kind of everybody gets a, a, a voucher. Um, Dean Baker is the original proponent of this. He calls it an artistic freedom voucher. And that, that voucher entitles you to spend on a platform like a kind of public Kickstarter kind of thing. 
but that anybody who wants to sign up to that Kickstarter to receive funds has to basically agree that any cultural work they produce, any creative work will be released under a, a Creative Commons style license for the next five years or something like that. Um, and so the idea there is that if you are particularly untrusting of collective institutions and, and sort of social administrators to be um, managing, you know, who gets paid to do what art, and I guess there are real concerns there, both from the kind of Soviet model, even or in the New Deal model, there were political struggles within the arts programs, or I think they overall did a pretty good job, um, that you could have a system where everybody gets a bit of cash and can sort of vote with their dollars at the same time as, as they're voting with their votes in the in the ballot box about what kind of programs to, to fund. Um, and I think this is different from something like, for example, a universal basic income, where the focus there is on consumption. So the idea there is we'll give you some cash and you can use it to sort of buy a movie ticket. Whereas what this is really about is actually more like an investment voucher, a universal basic investment stake. So you get to kind of vote with, with your dollars about who should get to produce the next album or whatever else. You know, I participated in Kickstarters for uh, Veronica Mars movie or, um, you know, people wanted to make a new album and they get 20 friends to, to chip in money or something. And then they say, well, we'll release the album, you know, um, for free afterwards. Um, and you could do that kind of thing relatively easily. Uh, and, you know, there could be a little bit of grift around the edges, but not so much that it would be, you know, any worse than what goes on with, with tax fraud at the, the top end of the, <laughs> the current spectrum anyway. I wouldn't be worried about sort of somebody getting 200 bucks from their friends and kind of, you know, getting away with it. I think that the overall outcome would be that it would actually ask people the question of what kind of art would you like to see made? Um, for the first time in a lot of spaces. Um, and in that respect, it would it would be like um, the kind of participatory budgeting that you're seeing in places like New York City where they put different projects on the ballot and people actually literally kind of allocate dollars on the ballot for different things they would like to see invested in. So, yeah, so I wanted to follow up on that a little bit because this was an aspect of the paper that I thought was really was really interesting. And, and I, I get the concerns about kind of centralized distribution of investment in artistic production insofar as you know they the you know the the funding body could be influenced by factors that we think are undesirable in a broader social sense and how kind of dispersing that decision making might better reflect the kinds of work that people actually want to consume the kinds of investment that they want to see I wonder if you're concerned at all about any kind of incentive effects uh, 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 accompanying that or whether you think that they are uh, potentially even a good thing. And I, and I guess my, my point would be like, as it stands, and, 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 in, and in addition, under the sort of MMT approach or the job guarantee approach to artistic production, you know, you would be kind of agnostic as to what it is that people produce. It's like you, you produce and you get paid irrespective of what it is you're producing. And so the production decisions would be driven by the aesthetic preferences of the author. It seems like by turning it around, you create like an incentive for authors to try to satisfy the aesthetic preferences of, of their audience, which of course is precisely the world we have already, right? But I wonder yeah. whether that is necessarily the most um, normatively preferable world. In other words, do we want art to reflect kind of uh, revealed preferences or do we want art to reflect something else? Yeah, so I think that thanks for asking because I think it's important to clarify this. So when it comes to the job guarantee, I don't think the model is anyone who wants to be an artist calls himself an artist, gets a salary, and then that's it. I think there is an element in the job guarantee of a collective determination of valuable projects. And that was the case in the New Deal. There were program administrators who decided who got to be in this program or that program and things like that. And, you know, whether I actually worked for a while for Americans for the Arts and one of my jobs there was to look at um, arts funding op options in federal economic development grants. This was in 2010, so right after the, the stimulus money was sort of filtering through. And there were things like highway beautification where there was an opportunity to paint murals. There were things like building cultural trails through through cities. And those are things that you actually have to have someone making a decision about which mural goes up over someone else. People get commissioned. Or if there's going to be a festival, you have to choose which which productions actually get a slot on the on the program. 
So I think that the idea that art has to be socially accountable to be paid under a job guarantee is still there. It's just that with that process, you're using democratic public governing institutions, or it could even be, you know, local, it could be the money goes to nonprofits and nonprofits can do that if they meet certain criteria. Um, whereas with the, with the kind of voucher model, you're really decentralizing it down to individual people. Although you could imagine with the voucher system as well that, you know, there could be intermediaries that form where you donate your money to the intermediary and the intermediary has a kind of list of programs that it has curated and sends that money out. I would be want to make sure that it didn't end up becoming a kind of world vision scenario where they take 40% of it as overhead or something, mm. but that you could imagine something where like, you know, I, I donate my money to the, you know, African-American cultural community, cultural committee trust, and they allocate that out according to a set of criteria they've developed or something. If I don't want to do all the work myself, i um, recognizing that there actually is an infrastructure that goes into the curation and, and, and selection and, and sort of scouting of new art, arts. Um, I would say that throughout history, most art has had a pattern in some way or another. Um, and, and so I don't think that it's that different in that respect. But the, 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 the third prong here, and this is, I think, gets to the heart of what you're saying is what we need to do is have a world where there's more economic justice and people have more time where they're not working on what we might call socially necessary labor. So one of the things about a job guarantee and, and MMT in general is it's trying to achieve a world of more prosperity and, and where the distribution of work that needs to be done or, what, or you know, not, not just needs to be done in the sense of sort of, you know, energy and food and, and education and firemen and that's it, but like the kind of what we would consider to be the, the diverse range of the economy, we can also put limits on that and say, okay, maybe we want a four-day working week. Maybe we want to have, you know, paid leave for child care givers. Maybe we want to have, you know, sabbaticals for people across a whole range of industries. And so expanding this, the amount of time people have in the week for themselves and giving them more material prosperity where they can invest in their art that isn't accountable to anyone except themselves is an important part of ensuring that, as you say, all art doesn't only have to, you know, involve the revealed preferences either of the public or of the market, however you wanted to, to describe it. Um, but I, I think that one way to do that particularly is to, is to give people more of their time and their life back and give them access to, to that material because short of um, literally uh, obliterating the difference between work and non-work, um, it's very hard to, to otherwise, um, have any sort of value proposition without thinking about who is going to be in charge of creating the boundaries for that. Mm, mm. Well, Rowan, thanks so much for coming on the show today. This is a, a great paper, a provocative conversation, I think, and I look forward to reading more of your work in, in this area. Thanks. And I, I'm not sure if we mentioned it earlier, but the paper is called um, Who Owns the Intellectual Fruits of Job Guarantee Labor? Um, and it's in a it's in a book uh, by Palgrave, edited by Michael Murray and Matthew Forstater, called um, uh, "Modern Money and the Job Guarantee: Realizing Keynes's Labor Standard." Uh, and a copy of the chapter is also available on my website, rowangray.net. Great, and there'll be a link in the in the liner notes as well. Okay, thanks a lot. Appreciate taking the time. Oh no, the pleasure is all mine, and I, I look forward to talking to you again soon, Rowan. Great, take it easy. <laughs> when
If there is- 